वाहे गुरु 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 वाहे the topic of religion and, and medicine is, well, I didn't study as you saw, I studied uh, um, philosophy. But I can give my, uh, my kind of, uh, from a spiritual point of view, my viewpoint there. Um, I might need a doctor today because I'm a bit unwell, but still. <laughs> um, okay, so the, let's start with first the Hippocratic Oath. This is something that uh, you nearly know, every doctor um, tends to read about and it takes that up. Um, and that tends to be that you will treat people regardless of you know their background or you know what you feel about them what's interesting about that is is a is a very poignant story from Sikh history about the Hippocratic Oath when um, during battle there was a Sikh who was um, going around after the battle giving up medicine uh, to people uh, you know who were Sikhs but then he and water and what happened was that uh, he came across enemy soldiers that were asking for water these enemy soldiers happened to be of another religion, Islam, but also obviously opposed to the Sikh interest. And um, he carried on giving water to the enemy soldiers as well. Um, some Sikhs at that time objected to this, said surely they're going to get better and fight us. Um, and he was then holed up in front of the Guru. So here was the Guru having to decide there, and the tenth, uh, the tenth Guru, Guru Gobind Singh Ji Maharaj, is now having to decide upon this case where a complaint has been made. And uh, the Guru asked Bhai Kaneya Ji, so why did you administer medicine to those people that were, you know, our enemies? And Pai Kanayaji said, well, I, oh, I, when I looked at them, I only saw you. Saw God's light inside them. And uh, then Guru Gobind Singh Ji said, well, then you should give them medicine as well. And so he was told to go beyond the water and carry on. So the Hippocratic Oath is something that a Sikh can very happily take. Um, and it's, uh, it's by census proven that Sikhs are like one of the highest number of doctors one of the highest numbers of doctors within the Sikh community. Um, in fact, recently a British scientist made a breakthrough in, in finding a new part of the human eye um, and, and a cure to blindness, and that was Harminder Singh Dua, a Sikh, uh, um, you know, with a turban and beard. So, medicine obviously is uh, very important to us. One of the interesting things is that the Guru himself was a doctor. Um, the fifth Guru was, uh, was actually killed uh, by fundamentalists who were trying to convert him. Islamic fundamentalists, but they weren't, weren't Islamic, they were Mughals, right? I'm not saying that, <laughs> so to distinguish between the state which was uh, and is a Mughal state, but happened to be Muslim rulers, yeah? Now, what it was interesting is that the fifth guru, his grandson, or great-grandson, ends up becoming the, the seventh guru, who was a, a very keen, um, you know, uh, uh, well, very keen on Ayurvedic med medicine, and had a, a great uh, garden full of, you know, medicines that were being grown, and the son of the king at that time, the Mughal king, who could have said, well, it's not really going to happen, he's not going to help me because my father helped to kill his great-grandfather, right? But he, his, his son, Darashikha, was unwell, and again asked the, uh, the se seventh guru for help. And Guruji straight away sent off medicine and actually cured Darashikha. Darashikha, unfortunately, was then killed by his, his younger brother, Aurangzeb, who was quite a lethal guy anyway. Um, but still, when asked for help, uh, the Gurus responded positively. And the principle there was again something very, key, very similar to Hippocratic Oath, where the Guru said, look, a flower is plucked by, by one hand and then given away by another hand. Right? And yet the flower gives fragrance to both. In the same way, we must treat both good or bad, you know, with the skills that we have. Um, so, the Sikhism uh, you know, promotes a very healthy and natural way of life. In fact, the Guru describes the earth as a mother. Um, and in terms of studying medicine, as I said, it's very, very promoted that we should, you know, study medicine and kind of help people. The Guru themselves were, you know, involved in medicine. Uh, in terms of modern ethics, uh, many questions come up around blood transfusions. That's not something a Sikh would worry about. So we never had an issue about that. So um, also, uh, you know, one of the other things that people worry about is, say, a male doctor treating a female or a female doctor treating a male. Again, Sikh, he wouldn't really have a big concern with that. Okay, just go by practicality. Um, one of the things that we wouldn't allow in Sikhism uh, is any kind of drugs, alcohol, and especially cigarettes. It's interesting because you know cigarettes now have been proven to be cancer-causing. Previously, they used to say things like you know put hair in your chest, make you a man, um, and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, women were smoking it as well. So I'm not sure how that, trans <laughs> that translated, but 
Um, nobody really saw the problem with uh, tobacco. And now we know it's really bad for us. But the gurus, uh, again, uh, were very against tobacco. And I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe that during time of Lent, and in fact during Ramadan, people don't actually smoke. So um, it's interesting because that's the kind of holy month and people aren't smoking it. Sikhs are forbidden from ever touching tobacco. Um, and again, alcohol and, and drugs as well. Um, Sikhi wouldn't allow circumcision for Sikhs. We keep the body as it is. And as you can see, we keep the hair as it is as well. Men and women are, you know, are not encouraged to cut any hair um, and just uh, be natural as they are. Um, there's no uh, hate for anybody who's homosexual. I know there's been a lot of uh, research into whether homosexuality is, uh, is, is genetic in nature or not. Uh, but anyway, um, Sikhism doesn't encourage any kind of um, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or, ag again, race. You know, many times in the past, doctors were used to prove that people, were, or people of different races weren't equal. Uh, the gurus were very much on the idea that all human beings are equal and very much ties in with what today's modern science would say that people are equal. Um, I want to go into uh, well, a couple of the um, well, last point on what our uh, on, uh, on our opinion. One would be that we're against any kind of child marriage, and again, from a medical point of view, it's been proven um, that you know fistula and other diseases often come from women that are giving birth when they're too young. Um, it's a very horrific thing that a woman might have to go through, um, and Sikhi would definitely be against any idea of of child marriage, uh, and you know again. Uh, that never happened in the Guru's period, and it's never happened really within Sikh, in the Sikh community. Um, beyond science, well, firstly, um, Sikhism believes, and Sikh, the Gurus believe, that all animals have souls. Um, even MRI scans nowadays have proven that animals do have feelings, although a lot of you know, uh, people of different backgrounds have said they don't have feelings, so they're just automatons. But Sikhs believe that in reincarnation, and that a human soul progresses, and so every animal must be treated with compassion. And the gurus are very much in, fa in favor of compassion. The seventh guru, alongside having his garden growing herbs, also had a, a, a zoo and a hospital for injured animals. Uh, and the compassion for all, all, of, all of nature. Um, in which case, most Sikhs actually do promote vegetarianism. And in fact, if you look at today's society, many of the problems we have in terms of um, depletion of resources and you know, not enough food going around, is because actually so much meat is encouraged. Um, and they see this kind of man's right to exploit the environment. Um, so Sikhs wouldn't agree with that. On the point of exploiting the environment, since Sikhism doesn't believe in a day of judgment and the world coming to an end, it's very life-affirming. Um, many faiths that kind of are waiting for the end of the world have been accused by atheists that they don't really care much about the planet and about, re about um, you know, the resource on the planet because they're waiting for the world to end in effect. Um, Sikhs are not waiting for the world to end. Uh, we're trying to promote a world and educate people to the point where we bring upon an age of enlightenment. So there is no end of, judge, end of days for us and no judgment day. Every person is judged as soon as they leave their, this human life. Um, so there's no kind of burials. But also that the, the aim of life, the aim of human existence is to develop to the point where there's, a work, there's an age of enlightenment across the planet. On the last kind of thing, actually it's interesting about a doctor because the gurus actually describe themselves as a doctor. So the word comes up, you know, the word bad, which means Ved, the doctor. Guru says, Mera bad, Guru Gobinda. The Guru is my doctor. Um, what does he treat then? The main thing that Gurus are trying to treat is the illness, which is at the core of all human beings, which is in the psyche. So we believe we're afflicted by five diseases. Uh, lust, anger, pride, greed, and attachment. If you look at the problems in the world, many of these problems can be traced down to these five diseases. Now, a doctor might look at somebody who's lustful, and treat them by saying you should, you know, I don't know, if somebody's depressed, they might treat them with, you know, chemicals. What's the holistic approach? What's the deepest disease that's beyond these five? That's a disease of separation. That the ego, um, which says me, me, I, me, is essentially not saying I am part of you and feels that it's part of the unity, which is the divine, of, of the divine one. We're part of that divine one. So we believe that every single person has a soul of God inside them and they can connect to that one. Now, the connection is the solution to these five diseases. So if people start to connect to the divine, um, and we actually believe in something called Dasam Dwar, which means that the body has a tenth gate, which is at the top of our head. Okay? It's a specific spot which through meditation you can um, open up um, and you can experience the divine. What's the experience like? It's extremely blissful um, and it can progress beyond bliss into being able to see the divine 
inside everybody, um, and being able to hear divine music. So what we call this Naam, connection, to the name of God. Funnily enough, a lot of religions believe the name of God is, very, uh, is great. We actually believe chanting the name of God is the way to find God. So we chant the name of God. Many religions have things like Islam, they have zikr, using the tasbih. Um, Christians believe in hallowed be the name of God. We believe that actually calling God is the solution, the panacea to all these problems. Um, and these five things can be cured by connecting to God. I'll finish off quickly. Um, in terms of drugs, drugs and addiction, this is something that uh, you know, a lot of societies are worrying about right now. You know, people are very addicted to drugs. It's a medical problem. It's not, um, it's not really a criminal problem. Unfortunately, society has criminalized uh, people that need medical help. Again, the gurus would say this comes back down to the five things, right? And the desire for bliss. So every human being has a desire for an, for an experience which is outside the mundane. Why do we have this desire for an experience outside the mundane? It's because God, where we come from, is bliss. If God is bliss, then we search for that bliss. If we don't find it from connecting to God inside us, then we find it from looking at drugs, alcohol, sex. Yeah? But actually, if we go back inside and experience God inside us, then we don't have the desire for these experiences. So what we call God is Anand Sarup. Anand means bliss. You might have met somebody called Anand. Uh, but the name means bliss. So we believe that by activating the tenth door here, by connecting to God through prayer, through singing God's praises, through meditation on God's name, we can experience the divine. And that actually becomes like the medicine, the real medicine for the soul. And in fact, a lot of physical problems can be solved by that medicine as well. A lot of depressions, a lot of anxiety actually leads to diseases within our body, and those can be solved. So Guru Say describes that Sarabaroka Okadanam, that the name of God is a solution to all the diseases. And in effect, you know, some diseases physically can't be changed, but our reaction to them. In fact, my dad sent me a really good article about a guy who was in the, um, in the uh, concentration camps uh, and then wrote a real book, but I'm sorry I can't remember his name right now, I'm sure you would know. But he, uh, he came up with a theory about that it's our reaction to circumstances that determines who we are and our search for purpose rather than necessarily the circumstances themselves. Victor Frankl. Victor Frankl. Um, and again, the Sikhs will say the same thing. That what happens in the world is kind of separate from our reaction to it. So again, the, the main focus of Sikhi would be to transform the mind. Uh, in any way, it's like the Philosopher's Stone was supposed to turn iron into gold. The guru says that the Guru's words and the meditation upon God's name is like that Philosopher's Stone, which can transform the metal insiders into gold. Not physical gold, but the idea of connecting to the Divine. So I'm sorry I've gone over my time. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions afterwards. Obviously, everything that we do goes on the YouTube channel. So you can check us out online. Basics of Sikhi. Shameless plug, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apologies for any mistakes I might have made. Wa'alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.